On June 2nd, Justin Boers, a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, visited Autodesk to talk about how to understand and evaluate the safety and sustainability of materials in additive manufacturing. All right, so uh, my name is Justin Boers. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am uh, getting my PhD in chemistry at UC Berkeley with uh, graduation in August. And uh, my academic background has been associated with polymer chemistry and organic chemistry but my passion really lies with uh, green chemistry. And this, the inception of this passion uh, came with uh, a class I took at Berkeley called Greener Solutions. Um, and in this class, uh, I was tasked along with a team of interdisciplinary students uh, to help a corporation, um, in this case HP, uh, and help them understand how to mitigate hazard um, from a proactive standpoint in their materials and chemicals. And from this class, uh, I learned a lot about the chemical industry. And what I learned was that uh, global chemical production is far outpacing uh, the global population increase. And so this has enormous uh, benefits, but also has enormous consequences to the health and the environment. Um, and some of those are already very apparent um, in occupational uh, cases in manufacturing. Uh, there's uh, thousands of deaths attributed to chemical exposure, along with 40,000 cases of asthma attributed annually to um, occupational exposure to chemicals. Um, additionally, um, for those of us in California, 70% of hazardous waste sites in California, legacy sites, are uh, leaking into the groundwater. Um, and half of the chemicals in these hazardous waste sites are often teratogens, um, neurotoxicants, carcinogens. Um, so a lot of these statistics are, are pretty frightening considering the pace at which uh, uh, chemical manufacturing is increasing. Um, and unfortunately, there are not many uh, regulatory incentives for chemical industry uh, to stop a lot of these um, hazardous uh, implications. And so um, that class inspired me to follow um, other paths in collaboration with industry, which led me to Autodesk. And uh, I am a contract worker for Biomimicry Institute and in conjunction with the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry. And together we have a shared vision for, um, for looking into and making decisions about safety and sustainability um, in the design stage um, so that we can prevent a lot of this hazard that I, I just mentioned um, before additive manufacturing becomes uh, widespread. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity because uh, additive manufacturing may be the future of manufacturing economy. Um, and so towards this vision, uh, we have the goal of being able to provide uh, an understanding and being able to evaluate sustainability and safety metrics um, for chemicals and materials in additive manufacturing um, so that uh, materials developers, industry, uh, printer operators, print end users um, can all make uh, safer, more informed choices about the materials that they are choosing for when they want to use a 3D printer. Um, so a lot of why, why people have gotten involved with 3D printing, besides the obvious functional benefits, um, is because it, it leads to a possible pathway to a closed loop manufacturing economy. Um, and some of the positive environmental benefits uh, potentially include less waste in the manufacturing process, less material used in products designed for 3D printing, on-demand production, less transport of materials due to localization, and then also ease of maintenance and reuse and remanufacturing. And we also see an opportunity for additive manufacturing to be totally circular such that the print could end up being used again in the 3D printer. So ideally, we could have a closed loop manufacturing economy, which starts at the raw material sourcing. So that's where um, the chemical, uh, the raw source chemicals are sourced from either agriculture or petrochemical sources, and then, uh, or, or bio, biological sources, then converted to the 3D printing materials that are used as a resin in the printer. Uh, through manufacturing of those chemicals. And then the next step in, in that cycle is a printing process in which people are handling that resin and are exposed to whatever hazard that resin might have. And part of that printing process is also the waste disposal, 
Um, so figuring out whether that, uh, that chemical or material can be recycled, landfilled, um, or it's classified as hazardous waste. And then the next stage of the life cycle is the print use, in which people are handling the print that comes out of the printer uh, and what hazards are, are associated with that. And then finally, it's the print disposal. So is that recyclable, landfillable, or is it hazardous waste? Um, unfortunately, at this point, the current reality is that it is not a closed loop. And there are additional concerns uh, with additive manufacturing. Um, one of them that's been brought up and studied at Autodesk in uh, conjunction with a colleague of mine, uh, Jeremy Faludi, um, is the energy use. And 3D printers have actually been found to be no more, on average, no more energy efficient than traditional CNC milling machines. And this leads to larger global impacts and could even outweigh any reduction in environmental impact from reduced transport or supply chain activity, which is a surprising result. Um, additionally, there are increasing routes and forms of hazard. So uh, 3D additive manufacturing is introducing um, industrial processes in places that have never been uh, there before, like in homes, in schools, um, and there's also concerns with uh, small businesses as well. And so these concerns are also uh, have been shown and uh, highlighted by the media. And so the public is becoming much more aware of these things as well. Um, so because of uh, the wider adoption that's occurring, the proliferation of 3D printing, um, increasing public concern, and even more stringent future regulations that might be coming down the line. Recently, we had the REACH regulations in Europe. Um, and, and such regulations uh, might be coming more stringent in the future in the US as well. These concerns uh, necessitate the creation of a framework for uh, people to choose and have specialized, safer materials choices. And so this creation of the framework, it starts first with the uh, determination of the life cycle stages. And I sort of delineated those uh, before, um, and I'll get into it in the next section. Um, and then the next stage is then identifying methodologies for evaluation of the uh, sustainability or uh, hazard metrics at each one of those life cycle stages. Um, and then at that point, we could uh, synthesize the data and uh, turn it into normalized uh, metrics for comparative analysis across all the life cycle stages. Um, and this will allow us to effectively compare materials and then further refine the metrics so that we get a more accurate depiction of the sustainability and safety of those materials. And for the purpose of this framework, we chose two different materials. Uh, we chose Autodesk PR48 and PLA, which is often used in FFF or FDM type printing. Um, so I want to get more into the life cycle stages, because so, it's very important to understand and parse these life cycle stages. Because uh, depending on what stage you're at, you're concerned about uh, different types of hazard or different ways in which people are exposed to hazard. So um, it starts with raw material sourcing and conversion to 3D printing materials. And for the purpose of, of our original manuscript that we uh, submitted to the Journal of Industrial Ecology, uh, we asked people to refer to relevant uh, life cycle analyses for these two stages. Although in the next revision of our manuscript, we're actually going to be running an LCA for comparative analysis. Um, but I won't get into that today. I'm mostly going to be talking about the printing process stage and the print use stage. And the printing process stage, uh, we wanted to have a threshold. And, and so we, we've given each stage a numerical score ranging from 0 to 2 when it has reached specific thresholds for safety and sustainability that we think are intuitive for specific application uses. Um, so for example, for printing process, a level two is a, a very sustainable, safe material that's consumer friendly. So this is something that kids can play with, um, the resin. It can be used in an environment with untrained users, like in a school. Um, a level one would be professional use only. So that's something like uh, the resin used here at Autodesk, since we have access to personal protective equipment. Um, so the uncured resin presents some hazard that requires training or hazard controls that are regulated here at, at Autodesk. 
And a level zero material will be one that's abnormally hazardous. Um, this isn't often run into, but it's a 3D printing material that requires additional safety controls. And then for print use, um, I'll just go over these thresholds real quick. Um, the level two would be safe for long-term contact, which includes oral and dermal, uh, and greater than 24 hours. So this is something that you might uh, put in your mouth like a toy, a kid would put a toy in their mouth potentially, or in-ear type uh, devices. Um, level one would be safe for intermittent skin contact, which is less than 24 hours or greater than one hour, and then unsafe for skin contact would be a level zero. And then I'll get into the rest of the thresholds later in the talk. So now I want to go into identifying those methodologies for evaluation. Um, and the first stage we'll look at is the printing process stage. And I'm just going to go over real quick for a printing process. The main hazards that are associated with this are the toxicity of the chemicals involved. Um, for example, PR48 has sensitization uh, properties. Uh, long-term environmental impacts, um, including uh, aquatic toxicity potentially, and also physical hazards that are associated with the resin or the 3D printing process. Uh, the main recipients of these hazards are um, intuitively the 3D printer operator involved. Um, so we're looking at their exposure when understanding what are the metrics for evaluation here. And then the key stakeholders include the materials developers and the printer operators. Um, and the materials developers, it, in some incentive, is you know, opening up 3D printing markets in consumer markets like schools and homes. Um, for Autodesk, it's reducing the operator's exposure to hazard or limiting the use of personal protective equipment. Those are some of the incentives that are involved. Um, and then the criteria we're, we're using for these metrics, that I'll go into more detail. Um, green screen, which is a hazard methodology framework. Um, reach regulations, which has detailed information about hazard. Uh, the Ferris Chemical and Material Library, which is a li searchable database for looking up the hazard of uh, chemicals. And, th and then literature that derives this toxicity data if we want to do a deeper dive. So I'm sure many of you are aware of the types of 3D printers involved, um, but all of them have uh, varying uh, ways of which people are exposed to hazard. Um, and some of these include for FFF, um, and SLS, the main ex pathway of exposure is inhalation. And something that I won't go into too much detail about, but that should be noted is that there's uh, a lot of evidence that these 3D printers produce ultrafine particles that are of high hazard, um, more than even, it's the same level as like a toaster, but they're also potentially more toxic than what would be admitted from a toaster. Um, additionally for SLA, uh, the toxicity of the compounds is what's most important here and the solvents that are used to wash excess unreacted material. Um, but it's important to recognize that um, a risk can also be mitigated by just reducing the inherent hazard of the chemicals. And so it's really important to delineate the differences between hazard and risk when we're evaluating methodologies. So um, hazard is the toxic toxicological properties, the endpoints, the potency of the chemical, the time scale of the effect, is it acute or chronic? Versus risk is how hazardous is it? What is the exposure pathway? And are you particularly vulnerable? So to simplify this and uh, highlight, we want to look at hazard primarily. And for Autodesk, we initially looked at, um, in my uh, pre uh, preliminary work, we looked at the toxicity of the monomer uh, involved since it makes up the largest component of the resin compared to other materials uh, in the literature and that are potentially used um, uh, in other commercial applications. Um, so I want to uh, quickly go into the relevant hazards for this analysis. Um, there's essentially six types of groupings of hazard um, that we're looking at. There's sensitization which includes respiratory, skin, and eye. Uh, sensitization or irritation. There's the acute toxicity components, toxicity endpoints, which include the acute mammalian, systemic organ, and neurotoxicity, immunotoxicity. And then there's the environmental and chronic toxicity, which include aquatic toxicity and chronic mammalian toxicity. Then we have the carcinogenicity and mutagenicity, and then we also have the reproductive developmental endocrine uh, endpoints as well. We also have the chemical fate, which includes persistence, and these are uh, important but often overlooked uh, toxicity endpoints, and the persistence is how long is the chemical 
surviving in the environment. And the bioaccumulation is how uh, is the ability for the chemical to be absorbed by an organism. And those are two very important components. And then there's also the physical traits that are involved as well. And so if we look at uh, a way to evaluate chemical hazard is putting this on a four point scale for each one of those groupings of toxicity endpoints. So for sensitization, it's more relate, related to, is it a known respiratory or skin sensitizer? Um, or is there only sus suspected evidence involved? Um, acute toxicity is ranging in, in how toxic it is. Is it low, moderate, high, or very high? Um, and carcinogenicity is also dependent on whether it's known or suspected, as well as endocrine disruption, reproductive toxicity, and developmental toxicity. Those are also whether it's known or suspected. And then uh, the rest of them are, also, are based on a scale of low to high toxicity. And this type of evaluation of chemical hazard, where you give it a numerical score, is not exactly how green screen does it, but it's derived from it. And I use this sort of evaluation to benchmark Autodesk's acrylates against other ones in the literature. And I just want to make a disclaimer here. Um, the numbers that you see on the right, these are other commercial acrylates. I, you can see that the numbers are much higher and therefore much more hazardous. Um, these actually represent the worst case assessments of the hazard, so there's actually a larger range of what it could be. Um, but this is just to show that acrylates from Autodesk are probably the best in class in terms of their hazard. Uh, but so that means that there's room for improvement, uh, but not from necessarily other acrylates, right? So it means that we may need to look at uh, making the acrylates less toxic or moving towards a different type of chemical because the, the hazard that is attributed to the acrylates has to do with its functionality for the polymerization. Uh, so that was the main conclusion that was, uh, that was derived from this analysis. And so when we want to go further and, and give a, uh, a good rating to Autodesk's PR48, we have to go um, and look at the total composition. So uh, Autodesk PR48 is made out of a reactive monomer, a reactive oligomer, two types, a UV blocker, and a photo initiator. And so this chart here is just summarizing all of the data that I uh, compiled for each type of toxicity endpoint. And so for each grouping, I give the rating a range from one to four, for example, for reproductive development and endocrine disruption, because uh, some of the components have a rating of one, and some of the components have a rating of four. So this is how I grouped each category. So I gave them a range for each uh, toxicity category. And then I also gave a percentage of unknowns. And then I averaged out these, or, or I used a weighted system. So I weighted the coefficient of this toxicity category as 0.2. And what I found from doing this analysis is that uh, you can use any number of weighting coefficients. You could do a complete average, or you could give carcinogenicity uh, 0.25. It wouldn't really matter in terms of comparing chemicals because they'd still have around the same rank. Uh, but I chose this weighting because it seemed to make the most scientific intuitive sense. And what that resulted in was a score of between 2.5 and 4. And the reason why we show it as a range is to try to be transparent about what's going on, right? So we know that there's some components that have around 2.5, but there's some components that have around 4. So it could have a toxicity, overall toxicity between those two. And we don't want to average it out because that would not be uh, transparent enough. And so we made particular thresholds um, for uh, these overall hazard ratings. And you see that it's in orange there for uh, Autodesk PR48. And so that means it's a level one because it's, uh, its lowest number uh, reached a particular threshold that would give it a level one. And PLA, we analyzed polylactic acid, which is uh, an analog to PLA and has a lot of toxicity information. And by analyzing that, we got a number around 3.6, which is very high, meaning it's um, it's, it's a uh, low hazard type material. And so it has a level two rating. So now I'll move on to print use. So the difference between print processing criteria and print use criteria, uh, we could do a similar green screen like analysis, which is what we did for uh, the print processing. Um, however, uh, there's uh, a lot more chemicals involved in the print 
because what comes out of the printer uh, may be a complex mixture of chemicals. Um, and un unlike the print processing uh, material, because we know what's in the print processing material, but there's a much more complex mixture in the, the print uh, sometimes. So that might make analysis through the similar procedure that I just did much more time consuming and laborious. Additionally, there's less room for certain uncertainty as consumers who may be in contact with the prints often demand higher standards, standards for safety. And so the main hazards associated with the print use um, is the toxicity of the chemicals of the print, any long-term environmental impacts, and the main recipients of the hazard in this case, and this is the difference between the print processing and print use, um, is that it's the print user instead of the print operator that's exposed to the hazard. Um, and the key stakeholders here are, are the material developers, the printer operators, and the print users. Um, and the criteria used for this um, primarily is the ISO 10993 regulations, which are used for uh, medical devices. And the developing UL guidance, which is a company that we've been collaborating with that is helping us understand what sort of tests we want to uh, compile in order to understand the potential toxicity of the prints. And so this is a list of, of the criteria that uh, we think should uh, be met in order to give a level two, which for print use would be safe for long-term contact, both oral and dermal, greater than 24 hours. Um, so that means that there's no chemicals on the available restricted lists in the literature um, or online regulatory lists, government agencies. Um, there's no chemicals of very high concern according to REACH criteria. Additionally, it must pass a battery of tests for phthalates and the heavy metals, especially cadmium, lead, chromium, and mercury, under 0.1% by weight. Um, additionally, it needs to pass a battery of tests for cytotoxicity, which are delineated in the ISO 10993 regulations that I specified for medical devices. Um, and it also must pass a battery of tests for irritation sensitization and intracutaneous reactivity that are also delineated in the ISO 10993 regulations. Um, and so that's a level two. A level one, it, it must pass the first two and the battery of tests for cytotoxicity. However, uh, for, because it's intermittent skin contact, it doesn't necessarily have to pass the test for the under 0.1% by weight heavy metals or the battery of tests for irritation sensitization or intracutaneous reactivity. And this would probably, uh, PLA would probably be a level one material because there might be uh, some potential lactic acid and it's been shown to produce side effects such as reactivity, irritation, or sensitization. Um, um, and for a level zero material, um, we think an un, uh, a cured uh, PR48 plastic that has not undergone a uh, UV uh, post curing would result in a level zero, which is unsafe for skin contact, um, because it would likely not pass a battery of tests for cytotoxicity um, in addition, it may have some chemicals of very high concern um, still attributed to the resin uh, that is um, uncured in the final print. The last two stages I want to talk about quickly are stage D and F, which are the stages in which we're concerned about whether the resin or the print is uh, recyclable, landfillable, or uh, is hazardous waste. And for these, uh, the, the main hazards that we're concerned with are the long-term environmental impacts of the waste chemicals. And the main recipients of the hazard is the global population. Um, and the key stakeholders here are the materials developers. Um, you know, we're looking, maybe the incentive is to cut costs and labor for waste disposal. Um, there's also favorable marketing advantages to, in promoting your product as recyclable. Uh, you also have the incentive of reducing the environmental impact of the chemicals. And the criteria used for the metrics are the guidelines by the EPA and DTSC that classify uh, compounds as, as either hazardous waste or potentially recyclable. And so the logic scheme here is pretty simple. Um, is the material fully biodegradable, recyclable, or compostable? And if yes, then it's a level two material. If not, uh, we have to consider whether the material is hazardous waste. If it, if it is not, then it's a level one material and it can be landfilled. Um, if it is, then it's classified as level zero because it's hazardous waste. Um, 
So um, at this point, we have identified the methodologies for evaluation, and we'll continue to refine those. Uh, but the next step is to synthesize all that data that I described and the ratings that I described for PLA and PR48 for comparative analysis uh, that will allow us to actually make good comparisons between those materials across those uh, life cycle stages and then continue to refine those metrics. And so here's a summary. Um, and as you can see for PLA and Autodesk, um, the PLA, PLA filament uh, achieves a level two for uh, the printing process, the printing process waste disposal, and print disposal. Uh, the only place where it's less than level two is the uh, print use. And this is a prediction. This, I, I, should, I should say that it's not something that we've actually evaluated, but we, what we think it would uh, achieve, which is a level one. So because of this and because of the weighting that we attributed to each one of those stages, it has a summary metric of around 1.75. So that, that would mean, according to this, it is an improved material, but not a completely safe and sustainable material. Um, with Autodesk Standard Clear, unfortunately, there's a number of stages in which it achieves a only a level zero, which is the lowest level. And that includes the um, printing process waste disposal and print use. Um, and then for printing process, it only achieves a one, and for print disposal, it's land fillable. And so its summary metric uh, comes out around 0.5, which unfor unfortunately is one of the lowest levels that we've attributed for the thresholds. Um, so this, what this uh, sort of analysis highlights is you know, what ca hazard categories and which components should be first examined uh, when one is seeking to design materials that are safer and more sustainable. So clearly for Autodesk's uh, standard clear PR48, we could probably do a better job with um, you know, hazardous waste for the printing process waste disposal or the print use section. Um, so this sort of highlights where we need to do some work in terms of safety and sustainability. So I want to move over into um, another collaboration that Autodesk did with uh, Berkeley, which was the Greener Solutions class that I mentioned earlier that I had taken four years prior with another company. And how this ties in with what I've been doing is that the students were tasked to explore bio-inspired approaches to um, 3D printing resins. And then they were asked to identify alternative resin materials uh, on a, a different scales of disruption, um, and then evaluate those, those new resin materials using the evaluation methodology that I prescribed. Um, and so they were able to uh, come up with a good list of varying disruptive uh, technologies or resins um, uh, that are bio-inspired. Um, and so the first strategy would be to replace the photo initiator. And this is something that has actually been worked on extensively by uh, Chris Venter here um, in looking at curcumin and riboflavin as the photo initiator, which are inherently much less toxic than the current photo initiator that we use in Autodesk uh, PR48. Additionally, we have, they thought about modifying the acrylate-based resins. So this is modifying its backbone to be uh, more biocompatible. Uh, so having a, a backbone like triglycerides or chitazan uh, would allow for less uh, bioaccumulation to occur and therefore less exposure to the functional hazard of the acrylate. And then the last thing that they looked at were brand new types of ways of looking at SLA. And what they chose were pH photo initiated resins. So that means uh, instead of just photo initiating the reaction, uh, the light would actually cause a pH change um, in the resin mixture that would allow for another chemical reaction to occur that would uh, change a liquid to a solid. Mm -hmm. And they looked at uh, calcite and metal ligand complexes in this case. And then what they did was they evaluated. Um, and at this stage, I, I had not completed the evaluation methodology that I, I just delineated. Uh, so they were really only looking at the printing process stage. Um, so they're looking specifically at these hazard endpoints um, for the printing process stage and seeing how they compare to Autodesk's resin. And what they found is that uh, the green indicates decreased hazard and red indicates uh, identified hazard. So in a lot of cases, they had some decreased hazard, although there's still some identified hazard um, from a lot of these different technologies that they indicated. And that was one of the main conclusions that they found. Um, so I just want to give a summary of the work and the future endeavors. And I, uh, I delineated the process for which the framework uh, occurs. 
and how we identified methodologies for evaluation after determining the life cycle stages, and then looked at all that data and were able to compare two materials, PLA and PR48, and then uh, looked at ways that we could potentially refine those metrics. And so this will give us an understanding uh, and evaluate the impact of these materials. And then once we do some uh, psychometric analysis, um, which includes measurement analysis, um, and, and the measurement analysis allows us to refine metrics, criteria, and thresholds to optimize the accuracy of the classifications. And a second stage of improvement called uh, principal component analysis, um, which allows us to illuminate previously undiscovered patterns and correlations between different components of the safety and su sustainability metrics that I described already. And then, uh, so that's in the works. And then also in the works is uh, disseminating our, our work in newsletters, blogs, and with our collaborator collaborators. And currently we have a number of ent entities that we're collaborating with that are excited about uh, utilizing this sort of framework. Um, and then we also want to make it actionable totally in industry and have them incorporate it into their material design uh, in the future. Um, so that's it. Um, and I just want to give a thank you to um, all my collaborators at Autodesk, which includes Susan, Don, Julia, Brian, Capra, Raphael, Shalom, Chris, Michael. Um, I want to thank my collaborators at uh, BCGC and UC Berkeley, which include the Greener Solutions team and uh, my mentors, Martin Mulvihill, Meg Schwartzman, and Tom McCaig, and at Biomimicry, uh, Beth Ratner. So uh, thank you for your time, and thank you for listening. <laughs>